What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode here on the Lure Lab on the Sirius Angler Network. I am your host and the captain, Andrew Full, and today we have an awesome episode. We have Alex Rudd joining us, and all of his stuff will be down below in the description. And we're talking his favorite crankbait. It's going to be the Money Badger uh, by Berkeley. It's a cool thing. If you've seen any of his YouTube videos, I think he talks about it in every one at this point. So I'm really excited to get him on here to chat about that. But if you haven't checked out last week's episode, you know, there's some major tournaments going on in Florida right now. We had Mike Schnupp on who used to live on the Harris chain and we were talking about speed worm and, and um, that technique just catches a ton of bass, super exciting, awesome episode. He gave up a ton of juice, but I don't want to keep talking on that. So let's get Rudd right on here and break down why the money badger has become his favorite crankbait. What's up, buddy? How are you? Yeah, I like the whole, it's, he mentions, mentions it in every video at this yeah. point. I think, I think... <laughs> that's every, like that is what I do though. This time of year, that's the that's the best part about this crankbait is like when it came out and I got my hands on it, I thought this is the thing that I'm literally going to have tied on all fall throughout the winter into the spring, and that happens to be the money badger. And so yeah, it's it's a hell of a little bait, man. I'm excited to talk about it. It's funny. I I think the last three videos I watched, it was like Money Badger, Money Badger. And the last one was the tail race one yes. with you and uh, Noak and Caleb. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I bet he's going to throw a Money Badger. And sure enough, the orange Money Badger came out. And I think you caught like a beautiful smallie right off the bat. And I was like, dang. I'm jealous. Yes. Yes. Instant jealousy. Dude, the money badger is, uh, it has been predominant this year, but that's for sure. It's, I can't wait to see how consistent it stays because I think right now with the money badger to already go down a small rabbit hole, I think where it's just so new and there's not a ton of people throwing it, that it's unique in its way that it's unique, that makes fish want to eat it just a little bit more. And so I'm excited. Also, like some of the color schemes, there's nobody else making them. You know, Berkeley's making some cool ones there. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm excited to get into this. You can already tell I'm like biting at the bit. And so like, I don't want to get into it without actually getting into it. But we're about to get into it. So let's, yeah, let's let it funny. rip. I think I asked you on Valentine's Day, like your true heart and soulmate, right? The Money Badger. I was like, you want to do an episode on the Money Badger? And you're like, yeah, let's do it. And I was like, yes. okay, perfect. <laughs> I'll, I'll so, yeah, yeah it's fantastic. So why? the money badger Why so, has it become prevalent to alex rudd so for me where i live here in east tennessee um and in the kind of style in which i like to fish you know, the small body medium diving crankbait is a staple in my boat and a lot of people's boats but you know from the time i was big up enough to walk and i was fishing i was throwing a small body medium diving crankbait you know the original crankbait the og that a lot of people have is the bandit Bandit 200, 300, you know, I have boxes upon boxes of full of bandits out there. And, you know, my first fish I ever caught by myself was on a bandit. And it's just, you know, that type of fishing this time of year specifically, you know, when we get pretty much from October until April, you know, we are small body, medium diving crankbaits. Everyone has one tied on and it just plain catches fish. Now, the, a lot of the reason we pick small body medium diving crankbait for you know a lot of the lakes that we're fishing like these highland reservoirs like norris uh, cherokee douglas and then even some of your like lowland you know river style lakes like watts bar chickamauga you know the tail race we were talking about that as well and we'll get into that that's a whole nother kind of you know aspect or dynamic of this but those highland reservoirs you know have a big drawdown and this time of year a lot of those fish are focusing on more vertical style cover, whether it be bluff walls, you know, um, 45 degree angle banks, you know, just anywhere where there's deep water access. Um, that's where those fish kind of want to be. And I often tell people like specifically with, you know, like the bluff style walls, those fish don't really have to go anywhere. They don't have to move horizontally. They only move vertically. So if they jerk the water down six or seven feet, like they often do, and they're probably going to do today before this big, you know, front moves through, they'll jerk the water down five feet. Those fish don't have to swim out. They literally just sink down as the water drops. And so 
this tool being the money badger and a small body medium diving crankbait is the ultimate tool for kind of focusing on and, and hitting those fish where they live. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's why I picked this tool. And, and then too, I'm also just like a, a crankbait head. Like I want to go crank. I want to power fish. And then, you know, a lot of people want to like drag a Ned rig this time of year or drag a jig and it's all good. And you can catch fish doing it. And I have to do it sometimes, but if I'm going to be doing anything. I'm going to be power fishing and, and this crankbait, allows me to just really optimize those areas the most that kind of vertical cover uh, the 45 degree angle banks and then just obviously all the kind of terrain that comes with that bottom compositions such as like you know big boulder rock gravel rock lay downs those types of things you know you know this crankbait specifically is designed to come through that stuff as efficiently as possible so not only can i hit those areas efficiently can I power fish through those areas but then i'm doing it in a way that i'm not having to worry about getting hung up and you know, breaking off a bunch of crankbaits because the tool that is the money badger allows me to get in and get out of that stuff and get bots. Yeah. And one thing I must say about it is it is an extremely like cosmetically appealing bait. Like they're yes. pretty baits, but the yes. first thing that always stands out to me with the money badger is the bill and the yeah. way it's designed. So can you touch on the bill for me? It's like that unique wide spoon bill type bill. It's more, I don't know the exact like terminology be but it's wide why why do you think berkeley designed that bill to be that way yeah so i always say it looks like a water drop is exactly what like a water drop or a teardrop you know what i mean um and i i've not talked to dan about it specifically because dan spangler is the man who designed this bait and he is very very proud of it and uh but I, I think the main design point of the bill is just its ability to come through cover um, that is one thing that is really awesome about this crankbait that I haven't found in many other crankbaits. You know, a Spro Rock Crawler does a, a, a fairly decent job of coming through stuff like laydowns and, you know, through the, you know, little tight rocks and stuff like that. A Bandit is notorious for just being hangy. So are wiggle warts. You know, I mean, they just don't do a great job. Whereas this bait, you know, when I feel it coming up on a limb, I can stop reeling and just kind of sweep my rod and just pull it over things and bring it over things. And I think a lot of that has to do with that design that when it does deflect, it really rolls that bait up in a way. So like where most crankbaits will kind of deflect and they want to kind of roll and just roll down, this thing really rolls up and it rolls that body almost completely away and then comes back to a center. Um, and so I think that's the main design reason behind the bill. Um, and I've really just noticed that from uh, essentially throwing it up in a lay down and just like trying to crank it out of there and watch what it does. That's something weird that I'll do that. I think a lot of people pick up a bait and they just go throw it and they don't like examine it. Whereas like, I'll literally take it and like, there's a lay down that I can see down into. Let me see what this thing does when I roll it over a limb, because it helps me then kind of visualize what it's doing when it's in 10 foot of water. You know what I mean? Right. And so I think that's the big thing. I think it's just essentially helping it to get in and out of whatever kind of cover you happen to put it into. Um, And then this bait also was originally designed to be trolled for walleye. Mm -hmm. And so I think Dan probably in his mind, and he would probably support me on this in saying this is like, you know, if you're trolling this bait behind your boat and it's in 15 foot of water, you can't worry, be worried about it getting hung up. It has to be efficient in coming through cover. And so just the way, not only with the disc, I, I, let's back up a little bit. I think the bill also in unison with that little disc in the bottom. So that's one thing that we'll get into, but the disc in the bottom is going to push that very weight forward. So not only does this bait have a sharp diving angle, but once it hits a piece of cover and it does want to like hit, it rolls up over and it's really doing a good job of just getting through those different types of cover and not getting hung up. Hmm. Yeah, that disc is intriguing to me because one of the only other baits besides a fritz side that has like that body disc in the bottom of it, right? When you look at a crankbait like an OSP, I don't know if you've ever thrown them, but Mm -hmm. they have that tungsten ball that's in a relatively similar area. And with all the research I've done, that ball or disc is in that place on a crankbait to actually help with casting distance and stopping it from rolling through the air so you can get an extra 15, 20 feet of it. Am I correct on that or am I completely off basis and wrong? I mean, it makes sense to me in my brain. You know what I mean? I would have to talk to the bait designer himself to really know. But I mean, you know, 
I think weight transfer, you know, this has a weight transfer system in it. I think that's the biggest thing. I mean, because once you get that tungsten ball to go to the back end of that bait, that's really where you get that kind of extra distance out of this thing. From my like experience with this crankbait specifically, I don't know about the OSP. It may be a completely different thing because I know Dua Realis has a similar weight transfer system where oh, yeah, they have the little like ball underneath as well. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Whereas with this thing, I mean, it literally sits in the water like this. So like when you drop this crankbait in the water, you know, some crankbaits are going to sit like this. This thing has, I mean, it's literally sitting there. It is ready to go. Like it's ready to start doing nose, the job. Nose forward, I think. Nose like forward. The, yeah. The terminology, right? Yeah, so. I'm, I'm, I have this on video. I'm sorry, everybody listening on podcast form. I'm better than this. I'm a podcaster. I should yeah. know that. <laughs> so what I'm saying here is it's build down, you know, it's literally ready. It's in that diving angle and it's ready to dive. And another thing that the disc does in the way that this bait is designed is it's a super, super slow flow. I would almost like go as far to say as in the right water temperatures, because water temperature does affect it. You have essentially a suspending bait. And that's another cool thing about this bait in that aspect of kind of that winter fishing. And going back to your original question, like, I can get it down there. I can burn it down and just stop. And this bait goes whoop and just literally sits there. It's not going to rise. It's, not gonna fall. it's yeah. And so like when you stop it in front of one's face and then you go again, a lot of times in that super cold water cranking conditions, you can get them to fire on it. But yeah, that little disc is a very interesting aspect to this bait that when I first got them, I didn't really even know. I mean, because, you know, you look at different sizes, some have two, some just have one but I think it all plays into just the overall, you know, action of it in the water and the whole kind of deal where it's this very, very slow float bait, which again kind of plays into that original design of trolling, but then also transfers really, really well to like the cranking and the winter cranking deal that a lot of us like to do down here in the South. I like it. So, and this is not unbeknownst to me, but I completely forgot there were two different sizes to the money badger. So we're oh, gonna add that into there's like five different sizes. Oh, because of trolling for walleye. Then yeah. yeah. Now I'm gonna add that into our last question that we'll have before we get into the other one. But um, I want to know what your favorite colors are. Like, is there three go to, one go to, five? Like, when would you throw each color of the money badger that you specifically like? And if you don't mm -hmm. mind um letting our viewers know what is your like favorite ones to throw and why yeah so my favorite color is gonna have to be blaze so blaze is definitely my favorite color I think that that's orange watching. one that orange one it's that <laughs> orange one anybody that's watched my youtube video yeah. knows blaze is like just a go-to color for me and i'll be totally 100 honest with you i don't know why orange works as well as it does this time of year I've heard a lot of theories about it, um, and we're actually going to get into the kind of the theories around that here in a little while. But two theories that I have heard is fish can't see as well when it gets cold. Their eyes don't work as good. Um, and so something that does a really good job of contrasting the water, they can kind of pinpoint in on it, and they can kind of react to it. Another thought process that I have is that crawdads this time of year around me they actually kind of start turning this color which is another one of my favorite colors this is fire tail crawl i like that one a lot where you get like this very very like you know muted green it's almost like a just a i mean literally like a matte green color but then you've got like this peekaboo on their belly of just this very very almost whitish orange that they get and so that's kind of where i think that both that fire tail crawl and the blaze kind of play because if you turn over blaze, you kind of get that whitish muted kind of almost mm -hmm. orangey pink color. And those are two colors that this time of year here in East Tennessee do really, really well is just the very methylate orange and that kind of pinkish orange color that we get. And so those are kind of my, like my ones and twos, like this time of year, if I'm going to tie on one or the other, it's going to be these. Now, as we move into the spring, there is a kind of shift in the color choices that I start to make. And that's when I start moving towards a lot of reds. Um, and, you know, you hear some people say, you know, don't fish red or whatever. I, I have, I've caught more. I love fish. red. I've caught more fish on red than I, I mean, I can literally fill this entire floor in here with four pounders of the fish I've caught on red. But like, that's when I start focusing on a lot of reds and then I start it mixing. It still has in. orange in the belly, I must say. It's, it's still a little bit of orange in there. And then I start mixing in some like yellows and chartreuses. Now, 
more specifically yellows, like a school bus, like literally that school bus. Mm -hmm. And like we, I, I actually do not know what this color is called. I wish I did, but this is literally like a school bus yellow color. And that's another thing that I don't know. It's called I, spring craw. I just looked it up. Yeah. Then, yeah, it's better in the spring. Say, but it's like this school bus yellow color. And there's again two explanations that I, I I theorize as to why they focus in on this. Number one is bluegills. You pull a bluegill out of the water in the spring, they're very pale. A lot, especially ones that like kind of live in a little bit deeper water, they're very pale and they've got almost this like baby crap yellow color <laughs> like it's the best one baby it's just baby <laughs> crap yellow color. and then then my second theory is and this kind of plays for even the blaze as well is that there's a lot more perch in my waters and in east tennessee and in essentially the whole tennessee river system than a lot of people think that there are and that so, makes sense I, to me. so I think that these really bright orange blaze colors do a really good job of mimicking perch and that yellow does a really good job of mimicking a perch. And so that's just two. Oh Lord, we've got it hooked here. There we go. I knew something was going to get hooked eventually. Um, but those two <laughs> colors I think is, is another theory as to why they work. And then I start shifting into obviously shad patterns. I mean, you know, I've got a bunch of different shad patterns and honestly, depending on water clarity, and kind of what I'm fishing around is going to depend on my shad pattern. Um, if it's is that clear, like a vanilla chartreuse. It is like a vanilla chartreuse. That's a beautiful color. I love that color. That is a smallmouth smasher, my friend. Oh, yeah. That is. Um, but like if I'm going, if it's a very cloudy, kind of just crappy day outside, that's what I'm going to go with. Something like that vanilla chartreuse or something like kind of a sexy shad, you know, something with a white base. Um, and the reason that I go with those white bases is it's just a contrast. Those more opaque colors tend to stand out on those cloudier days. And then if it gets real clear, that's when I'm going with something kind of translucent, a little bit of chrome, something way natural. Um, I don't crank a shad color a tremendous amount, but there's situations where it works. And a lot of the situations where I find that it works is either literally dead of winter when it's like bluebird high skies and it's just kind of sucky and or when we get really late spring almost to the shad spawn you will catch a bunch of fish that literally spit up crawdads in your live well but they'll smoke a shad color crankbait for yeah. some reason i can't explain to you why very it's just it's very interesting like i've caught so many of that like four plus pound class fish tossed them in the live well for a minute and like they're spitting up crawdads that literally look like a fire tail crawl but they are eating literally a chrome almost translucent crankbait like that i mean it is just it is a fascinating thing when it happens it sounds almost like they're reacting to it because they're like oh that's an easy meal i gotta eat it now but like not to rebuttal you but in the fall time i find like shad color crankbaits up here in the north work really well Mm -hmm. for small mouth and large mouth because that's the time of year up here for us when our bait fish start to get to like a certain size that are almost equivalent to what the crankbaits are that we're throwing yeah especially like late september october so that's kind of cool that's a little bit different for you guys like yeah. in june like that april may june period if we're not throwing a bluegill colored crankbait we're probably not getting bit like once Crazy. we're in like that late pre-spawn yeah. To almost like post spawn pattern, like we're completely skipping spawn. It has to be bluegill colored, yeah. in my opinion, to get bit on a crankbait. Yeah. So, it, and we're only like 600 miles apart, which is wild. Yeah. Well, I, I think, I think I would, I'm always fascinated by like the, the density of crawdads. I think that that's one thing that here, another reason why we throw so many crawl patterns is because the density of crawdads down here is insane. And then there's also this, variety of crawdads like i literally can go to one side of the lake and throw down a crawdad trap and get green crawdads go to the other side of the lake and get black crawdads and go to a mile down the lake and get orange and blue crawdads you know what i mean and so i think that that's why you see such a number one such a, like a tinkering kind of almost obsessively weird complexion towards crankbaits down here you know you got a lot of crankbait makers you got guys like me that like constantly want to tinker with colors and try to find the right color i think a lot of that has to do with the bass are literally just 
inundated with crawdads of all different serious angler rabbit hole real fast do you yeah. think the coloring of the crawdads has anything to do with the bottom like the bottom composition of the lake in the area where they're being netted and sure. the bass are being caught so like if you're catching fish in grass they might be that orange and red but if you're catching them on rock they might be more black and blue and if you're catching them in mud they might be like a brown and orange yeah you know what i mean like crawdads are weird to me they're because you can literally up here you can pull one off grass and it'll be like straight black and then if you go get one off a dock and a bass is spitting up it's bright orange cross it's like what the heck like it, yeah. Yeah. i think that's everywhere so yeah i think i think that you're dealing with a creature who's spent its entire existence since it was created trying to not get eat and you know so what they don't do very good at it either no they don't they don't but like whatever it has to do to adapt you know whether it's and i i've also heard so i think that they do i think they will change colors based on the surroundings um but and i base that off of like you know you look at certain types of lobsters and other crustacean style creatures like that you, they can change colors they adapt to their bottom whatever bottom they're on they adapt to it not fast not like a squid or a cuttlefish or something but they can do it um but i think the biggest thing that affects that is what they're eating i think that uh, you know uh you know, if they're consuming a lot of iodine, they're going to be red. And, you know, that you can get iodine from a bunch of different kind of aquatic plants. Or if they're consuming, you know, more, uh, you know, whatever kind of little stuff they dig out of the dirt, they may have a completely different kind of, you know, vitamin or, or mineral complex that turns them a certain color. I mean, it's just like us as humans. I mean, like, you know, if we eat a lot of onions, we smell like onions. Like if you take a bunch of vitamins, you pee this bright yellow color. <laughs> we're not as, we're not as like. If you eat curry, you smell like curry. Like Exactly. I mean, you know, we're not as like affected as far as like our melanin and all that. Cause that's just not how we work. But with certain creatures, especially crawdads like that, they change based on what sort of minerals or things that they're taking in. So I think that has a lot to do with it. Hmm. So yeah, those are all and it's just over my head. It's too scientific for me. Like, like I just know bass eat them, and it tells me to have every color crankbait and crawfish pattern that I absolutely can, and just have seven different, in my case, alpha angler rods rigged up and right. throwing a bunch of different crawfish colored crankbaits right. at them. And when you find a different vegetation or bottom composition, just change it up and see where you get bit. But let's digress, get off the rabbit holes for a moment, yes. and let's yes. talk about your rod, reel, and line setup. Yeah, so I think that that's super important. I always tell people, um, you know, that I get asked a lot, if I could only have three rods and reels, what would they be? And I always say, you know, seven-foot spinning rod, a uh, seven-four to seven-six, you know, medium-heavy general casting rod, and then a cranking rod. And a lot of that has to do with I crank a whole, whole lot. I mean, I'm cranking. I literally crank essentially the entire year. It's just different depths and different crankbaits. But my crankbait set up for the Money Badger, it's a seven-foot medium Fenwick Elite Bass. Um, it's a completely glass. It's a, it's a composite rod, but it is it is mostly fiberglass. And so it is very, very parabolic. Um, I love the rod a lot because it just is kind of old school. It's not got any of that kind of modern graphite feel to it. It is very heavy and it is glass. And that's and what I love about it. Beautifully and you don't lose them. Like if you get them hooked, it just like gums up into them. You're like, oh yeah, he's coming in. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, it is, it is just what I love because that's how I grew up fishing. I grew up with the big, heavy, just old school glass rods. And so that's what I love about that rod. But again, it's a seven foot medium moderate action uh bass elite rod by fenwick and i got that paired up with an abu garcia it's a um, stx it's the brand new the gen 4 ones and a 6 8 gear ratio and then this is where i'm a little bit different than other people i use a 12 pound copolymer so i actually mm -hmm. use the um berkeley fluoro shield and it is a copolymer it's a it's a um a nylon core with a fluorocarbon coating now, the reason that I do that is is two main reasons. Number one, it's extremely ab abrasion resistant. I mean, you can take that stuff and literally like rub it over the top of a rock and then stretch it and it's not going to break. It's got so much stretch because it does have that mono core 
that, you know, you aren't going to really damage that line a whole, whole ton. And I'm sure there's a bunch of great fluorocarbons out there that you don't have to worry about that as much. But for me and just how I fish and as much as I'm grinding and grinding and grinding, I like that abrasion resistance. And then number two, it's got just a little bit of stretch. I think having stretch in everything that you do with a crankbait is super important. Um, and the reason I say that is because when you think of like a money badger, you've got six little hooks that you're trying to get in their face. And the thing about those hooks is if your rod is too heavy, if your line is not ha doesn't have enough stretch, if the whole system just doesn't have enough give to it, you'll rip treble hooks out versus driving them in. And so when I got a, you know, a five pound smallmouth in the current below a tail race, like just absolutely dogging me in the current. The which two, they always do. Which like, they always they're, do. They're out of the water by three feet or they're going down to the bottom as hard as they can up current and getting a big bow in your line. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so just having fish. all that softness there, it's one of the only applications in fishing that having mm -hmm. that kind of softness and almost that detachment ability where you can totally detach from the fish where it's either jumping or it's turned or doing something and that bait is still just caught all in their face and it doesn't matter how much they pull it's not ripping it's just yeah. digging and digging and digging and so that's the reason i use copolymer in conjunction with that super super parabolic glass like rod. so yeah. that's and then the it's six a eight, little against the norm but that's awesome like they yeah. found something that truly works for you and that's the best part about fishing Yep. is the fact that we all have our own confidence absolutely so, absolutely stuff. yeah so sorry to cut you off what else were you saying oh, um i was gonna say uh that's a great question i was gonna say something oh six scare ratio real <laughs> welcome to my brain ladies and gentlemen i've yeah. not used the soundboard yet i might use the soundboard before this podcast is over just know that um anyway <laughs> um Six year ratio reel. I have no idea why a six year ratio reel is the best, other than I'm like a squirrel on crack. And so I have to slow myself down a little bit. But KBD himself said one time that the six year ratio reel is just the absolute best for cranking a crankbait. And I, I don't agree. think he, I don't think he has an explanation for it either. There's just something about that particular speed that I have had an immense amount of success on since the time I started throwing a bait caster to throw a crankbait. And yeah. it's if it ain't broke, why try to fix it? Kind of deal. And I I agree completely. I'm a six three to one gear ratio with all crankbaits, unless it's a rattle trap, then it's eight to one, for whatever reason. Like because yep. you know rip, rip, yep. and then you're like, oh god, <laughs> I gotta <Yeah>. get them. <laughs> like you just there's always that slack in the line as you're dropping to catch up. That's the only yep. reason why. I but guess. yeah, the, that is awesome. So, all right. Where and when do you throw the different sizes of the money badger? And we'll limit it to two. What are your two favorite sizes of the money badger? So my number one favorite is 6.25. Um, 6.25 is an 11 foot diving crankbait. Um, that crankbait right there is going to be primarily kind of what I was talking about earlier. Those, those more vertical style banks. I love a bluff wall this time of year. Now, that being said, there are lakes around me that are essentially just river channels. And there's, I mean, the whole thing's bluff walls. And so it's like, Alex, how do you pick the bluff wall that you're fishing? What just go I'm, fishing. Just go fishing. That's exactly it. <laughs> like, you want to like narrow it down and really kind of look. And, and today, even, you know, I told you while we were in the green room, I went to practice for a tournament that I had. What I was looking for was channel swing banks. I want to be on that outside swing of that bank where the current is dumping into it. And so when I'm looking for a bluff to fish, that's what I'm looking for. You know, when I'm looking to go crank this crankbait look somewhere, I'm looking, where does the current dump into? What does it run down? And then that's kind of the area that I'm going to look for because these fish are very, very lazy. They want things brought to their face. And the best thing, best way for them to have things brought to their face is to sit in the current and just sit there and wait till something comes by their face. And so that's like where I'm fishing um, that money badger, especially that 6.25 when I'm really kind of focusing on those bluff walls. Now, I told you we'd talk a little bit about tail race fishing. Now, I love fishing this thing below the tail race just because it is a phenomenal bait for crank, you know, cranking that kind of, you know, mm -hmm really high intensity, high speed water that we're fishing. And for people who have never fished the tail race of a dam um, here in 
you know, East Tennessee and along the TVA system, Northern Alabama into Kentucky, Mississippi, they will, the, the main function of our dams is flood control. And so this time of year, we have a massive influx of rain. Where guys up north, you guys have snow and ice. We just literally. I wish this year we have zero, to be honest with you. Like yeah, we got like 180 crazy. inches of snow before Christmas, and then we've had nothing since. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> See, we've just got a bunch of rain. Like, it didn't yeah. rain. But like, right. but like that that kind of when it is snowing for you guys and you have these massive, you know, weather systems that move across the country, it just rains here. And so the TVA designed these dams to help control flooding. And in the winter, that's why we have these massive drawdowns is so that these lakes can essentially act like this giant flood control Mm. mechanisms. And so one thing that they do is they will dump water or spill water over the spillways of these dams. And when they spill the water over the spillways of these dams, it creates a massive amount of current below these dams. And so what we will do, like a bunch of crazy crackheads that we are, we'll take our boats and we'll literally run them up below these dams and we will float down with the current. And these fish love this because a small mouth and a spot and even a large mouth is a very current-driven creature. And they'll sit and you can catch these fish you know, while they're sitting in this current. Now, in that situation, it's actually where I pick up the little bit bigger money badger, the the 7.25. And the main reason for that is it does a lot better job of cutting through the current. And it seems almost counterintuitive. You'd think the smaller body thing would, but what I've found is this bait will want to roll over. You know, where I said it has a does a really good job of deflecting. Well, it almost does too good of a job of deflecting where that current wants to roll that smaller bait over a lot more, where it seems like the more robust kind of just, you know, longer weighted one, yeah. your weighted one actually wants to kind of right itself a lot better in that current. Mm-hmm. And so I like the 7.25 in that situation. And then I also like the 7.25 when I'm on those Highland Reservoirs and I am fishing that kind of bluff style wall and it gets clear out. You know, where those fish kind of, they want to dip down and they go from being in like 8 to 10 and they get down into 12 to 15. This bait's going to hit that 12 to 15 a lot better. Um, and especially if you drop line size. So normally I'm doing like a 12-pound copolymer. Um, but if I'm wanting it to get a little bit deeper, I'll bump down to like a 10-pound. And you can add, I mean, two to three feet to a crankbait just by doing that, especially with that copolymer because it tends to be smaller diameter across the board. Than it's co- than it's fluorocarbon equivalents, and so that's kind of two places that I'm going to do that seven point two five versus the six point two five. But the six point two five is, I mean, it has literally caught me. I, I've lost count at this point. I'm probably upwards of well over a hundred fish in the past three months just on the six point two five. Just go back and watch his last three months of videos, and you'll see how much Elks Rod likes to throw the money badger. No money badger. I love it. So, all right. Alex, the last question here, right? You know, which has been customized by doing molds. If you love creating lures, and I know you just bought a paint booth, right? Like, so more do it mold stuff. You can customize and paint your own muddy badger blanks. If you want to sand them down and do it, you will mm. and have some fun playing around with spray guns and paint. Um, so do it molds juice of the show is why do bass tend to tune into red and orange colored crankbaits? such as the money badger during the winter and pre-spawn period. What is your thought process through this? So I, I, this is a theory that I have pounded on, and pounded on and pounded on. And I've asked people a hell of a lot smarter than me, biologists about this. And there's two really big conclusions that I've come to through my kind of obsession with the topic. The first conclusion we've already mentioned, and, and that is, I, I believe, and from everything that I've read and, and questions that I've asked, a bass's eyes just don't work as well when it gets cold. Hmm. Bass doesn't have eyelids. And, I mean, just like any of our body parts in the winter, when they get really cold, they just don't work as well. They also constrict. And so I believe that there's a lot of blood constriction and a lot of constriction to the eye of a fish during the winter time. And so they're just not seeing the world around them as, as good as they normally would. And so something like a blaze or a fire tail crawl does a really, really good job of contrasting the environment around it. 
and whether that be it's in a lay down, the bottom, the water clarity, whatever it is, that fish is able to see that drastic contrast of that color, focus in on it and, and hit it, you know, cause a fish feeds with a lot of different senses. It, it feeds with its lateral line, its sense of smell, you know, its eyesight, but you know, if they can feel the bait, but they can't see the bait, I don't think a fish is going to be as apt to eat it. Whereas if they can feel it and then they also see that contrast of that really bright orange or bright red or something like that, they're going to react to it and mm -hmm. they're going to eat it. The second thing is, again, we kind of touched on it. I believe it has a lot to do with what fish are rewarded with when they're rewarded with a meal. So if they eat a perch and it's high in protein and their body is very well nourished by it, and that perch is a bright orange, bright yellow color or a bright red color, then guess what they're going to do? They're going to keep eating that thing. They're going to keep trying to kill that thing that is that color, you know, uh, our bluegills, especially the sunfish, they get completely like this opaque orange and yellow color this time of year. Again, why they would hit that crawdads again, they get those oranges in them. And so I think there's just a variety of different bait fish and different forage types that they encounter that when that bass eats that thing, it's rewarded with a high protein, high nutrient meal. And that instinctual drive just goes, that was good. Now let's repeat that 20 times today. And if you present them with something that is like that bright orange kind of crawl color that we like to call them, or, you know, however we, you know, want to classify these baits, that that kind of, you know, rewarded with a meal kind of deal is what is going to drive them to eat those certain kinds of orange colors. Um, I also think that if you just stick something in your hand long enough, there's a possibility that they're going to eat it too. So, I mean, there could be that, that factor that everybody's throwing it, but really too, I, I truly believe the first two are kind of the main reason as to why those fish are focusing on it. Cause there's a reason it happens. I mean, like there is, I mean, dude, these I've had fish, especially the blaze. I had fish literally eat it all the way down to their crushers. They don't do that unless they are really, really, really focused in on, something that looks like that right there or it is just that good of a contrast compared to their environment that they're like oh there that is i can smoke it and so i think that's the two big driving factors yeah and i was gonna say too like in my personal opinion i feel like the orange colors and reds and like the bright yellows and stuff actually work really well if the water is either clear or muddy like it doesn't matter what the water clarity is that color just works yes during this time period unless yep. the water gets below like 40 degrees i and i don't want to get too far into this rabbit hole i don't know if you remember the i think it was a bassmaster classic on grand lake when aaron martins was throwing the was the lure jensen speed trap and it was like a bright chartreuse one the water was like 38 degrees yeah and that was like the only other anomaly but everyone else was basically throwing like a big spinner bait like jason christie or something red yeah so yeah it's just crazy they, yeah, it's they love crawfish early yeah. spring late yeah winter. i think i and it probably in that case and not to go down the rabbit hole too far it's just contrast yeah. i mean you just contrast and that's i mean a bass is a bass has rods and cones just like we do and in a lot of situations, I think they use, I, I forget which one is which, but like they use that part of the eye that sees contrast, you know, like there's a rod or cone, I forgot which one it is, but one of them helps to see like at night, like we see shapes. And so if there's some dude that's backlit on a hill, we go, oh, that's a dude backlit on a hill. Well, if something bright yellow comes flying past us, we go, oh, that was a bright yellow thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think the bass is the same way, except for where we don't try to, kill it with our face a bass tries to kill it with its face and we hook it and catch it so it's like what was that orange thing i don't think it's a crawdad but i need to eat it because i'm hungry or maybe it looks good so i want to be hungry so let's eat it yeah like, yeah i, I mean, can only imagine what a bass is thinking when this big rattling loud thing comes flying by their face and they're like yeah. that's not natural but i need to eat it because it yeah. looks good absolutely yeah <laughs> I mean, dude, like a lot of people underestimate like a bass literally when that flip gets hit, like when that instinctual drive to kill something gets hit, it's lizard brain. Like mm -hmm. they, they, their body literally physically can't stop going to try to kill it. Yeah. Like that's the one thing KVD had made an entire career out of it. 
which was bring it by their face fast and literally make them physically not be able to try to kill it. And that's all a crankbait bite is. I can't believe he's retiring. I know, I, it hurts me. I, it makes yeah. me feel old. That, makes, that's a segment for another day on the yes. Series Sangler Network. I feel that's like right. we could have an entire episode on KVD yes. and what we think is going to happen with his career. And But we'll leave it at that. And uh, Alex, thank you for coming on today to Lower Lab. I look forward to having you on more here in the future as the show here continues to grow. I appreciate you coming on and talking about the Money Badger. And uh, I look forward to next time, like I said. So, and good luck at your tournament. As people are listening to this, you will be fishing that derby being hopefully not too cold, but probably freezing yeah. on the and, cold and, Saturday morning. So and hopefully got five big ones in the boat and just be done with it. All right, listen, green, blue, purple, or pink? Pick one. Mm, green, blue, purple, or pink. I'm, I'm partial to green or blue because they're kind of on the same spectrum. So I'm going to go green. You will never forget the sacrifice that Sweet Baby Ray's made to save your own life and entrust in your hands the future of human civilization. Perfect. I love me some Sweet Baby Ray's. That's some good barbecue sauce. <laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Have a good night. Have a good day, Alex. We'll talk to you soon, buddy. See ya. See ya. Now, how about a sweet ending to the end of this Lure Lab episode with some sweet baby rays? We are no part affiliated with that, but I love the soundboard clip there by Alex Rubb. That was fantastic. Now I think I need to eat something, and I hope that made everyone else hungry who is tuned in. So <laughs> if you're tuning in on to this episode of Lure Lab on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. We greatly appreciate it. Leave a comment below if you've thrown a money badger, if you want to throw it after this, or what your favorite color is if you're listening on apple podcasts or spotify or whatever your favorite mp3 platform is for the lure lab please leave us a review down below we greatly appreciate that it helps us get noticed to more bass heads and helps us spread the word about lure lab but until then and until next time we will see you all next saturday